Bitcoin and Ether in all-time high mode. Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee. And teleporting to me virtually are my co-hosts, Coindesk Markets Managing Editor, Lawrence Lewitton, and Global Macro Editor, Emily Parker. Good morning, you two. I still had that Coindesk TV launch day afterglow. How about you? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Good day. Emily, you have a bit of that Doge coin fever still? Absolutely. Absolutely. Never goes away. I love it. All right. Well, we have some great news coming out today. Bitcoin is continuing its record setting path. European traders managing to push the price above $48,000 hours earlier. Right now, Bitcoin trading at about $46,200. It's up 7% in the past 24 hours, settling down in that area. According to trade block data, the XBX has been the most reliable Bitcoin reference price for institutions since 2014 with billions in assets under management benchmark against it. So Tesla's one and a half billion investment in Bitcoin is fueling uh, the uh, rise after an SEC filing showed the electric car maker converted almost 8% of its gross cash into BTC. So Lawrence, is this just a matter of time before other major public companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook start doing the same? Uh, don't count on it and don't hold your breath. And quite frankly, let's hope not. The thing is that companies are meant to do what they're meant to do. This isn't a fair use of, of their cash reserves. It, you know, people love Elon Musk. They're happy when he names his, when he and Grimes name their kid after whatever their cat comes up with when it runs across a keyboard. But at the end of the day, this is still kind of like a very meme sort of thing. Uh, and it's in, in many ways, they should be giving that cash back to the shareholders in the form of buybacks and a form of dividends. They should be investing it into the company, doing what the company does, which is make cars, make make batteries. That's really it, it, by not doing that and by putting in Bitcoin, in some ways, it's sort of not it's not a, it, it's not giving a seal of approval for what the company does. And that's a problem. All right. Lawrence, with some sobering commentary there amid the frothiness <laughs> we're seeing, Emily, several exchanges <laughs> are reporting problems keeping up with the demand for Bitcoin. So what do we know so far? Yeah, just to bring a bit more sobering news here, I think this recent surge has hit the industry like a, a rocket, and it just shows that the industry has a little bit of catching up to do. So um, we know that with this most recent surge, there were reports of Gemini, Kraken, Binance, all experiencing difficulties. So it's going to be a while, I think, before the exchanges truly catch up with this, this fever that's, that's sweeping across the industry. Well, luckily, our next guest could probably have a interesting commentary on this. He is the U.S. Managing Director of Crypto Exchange eToro, an Israeli-based crypto exchange with over 18 million registered users worldwide. Joining me in welcoming Guy Hirsch. Hi, Guy. Hello. Thank you for having me. Good to have you here. So did eToro experience or is it experiencing any problems with handling the demand following Tesla's big BTC purchase? We definitely see a dramatic increase in interest in the crypto asset class, both here in the U.S. and globally. Uh, we haven't had any uh, liquidity issues or sourcing liquidity for our customers, um, but we definitely see a growing demand that is uh, tasking uh, uh, other departments in the organization, given, given the, the volume. Uh, but we're happy to see this uh, trend. We're happy to see this uh, uh, greater adoption happening in the space, and we're excited for to, to see who's next. Hey, guy, when when exchanges go down because of heavy volume, some people say that it's a form of circuit breakers, that it's almost planned, if you will, that the uh, exchanges don't want to deal with some of the problems that might happen if prices move too rapidly on them. Is that what we're seeing this time as well, what we saw in recent days with the price shooting up and, and exchanges not being able to, to handle it? I think my, my answer varies between, uh, I would say, platforms that are on-ramp between fiat to crypto and platforms that are purely crypto. I think with for, on for companies that serve as an on-ramp to crypto, 
you might see some issues with regard to liquidity, uh, risk of, of, the, uh, of, of converting fiat into crypto. There's all sorts of settlement issues. So when one is depositing via uh, online banking or via debit cards, the company needs to hedge against the risk that that money may, might not be there when it's time to settle. And so it might have to do with other things than crypto per se. And for, for uh, exchanges that run pure crypto to crypto type exchanges, uh, I, I don't think that they're seeing the same type of issues uh, if you have those on ramps from, from fiat. And I think with those, you would see less of an issue. But, are, but is it in, in any way planned? Um, yes. So when it comes when it comes to to companies that have these these on ramps from fiat to crypto, sometimes you have to say, hey, you know, we can't satisfy the bank requirements for um, you know enough enough security deposits to to honor all these uh, all this money to be converted into uh, into crypto, and so you might see a planned action to to uh, halt or suspend or somehow kind of mitigate the risk. Of all this money coming into the into the platform, in that case, yes, and into crypto to, do, to pure crypto to crypto players, uh, it's it's less of an issue. And I don't think they have any sort of a kind of a circuit breaker um, uh, in terms of liquidity, especially in the in the large cap kind of you know in in, in assets like like Bitcoin and ETH and whatnot, uh, with with others that have maybe lower uh, market. Um, lower liquidity you might have some issues but not not in not in bitcoin so one thing that's interesting is is seeing this the surge in in, in demand uh and, and the surge in new users and that suggests that retail investors are playing a much bigger role in this uh recent bull run than i think people talk about right this is largely described as an institutional led bull run can you just talk a little bit about the role of retail investors do you think that it's been underestimated I think as opposed to 2017 and early 2018, we definitely see uh, the institutional player being much more dominant. And I think it reflects on the retail investor because when you have a company like Tesla uh, putting $1.5 billion into Bitcoin, you have a lot of retail investors gaining trust in Bitcoin. And so they're coming into the space not as a, a, speculative, a speculative play, but they are coming into the space saying, hey, if Tesla believes in this asset, I will buy and I will hold. Guys, and that is a different investor. Was eToro involved in any way with Tesla's one and a half billion dollar Bitcoin purchase? If not, where do you think Tesla got it from? That's the billion dollar question. That's a good question. So I, I, I can obviously comment if yes or, or if, yeah, if, if we were involved in one way or the other, but um, uh, that, that's a very good question. It's a very large purchase that was done probably over time until the disclosure to okay. the SEC was made. Um, yeah. Well, we also know that eToro has been in discussion w about going public. We see Coinbase it, uh, also preparing for an IPO. Is eToro, you know, had discussions with Goldman Sachs possibly in December with going public. What is the status of that? Uh, so I can't comment on any kind of IPO plans that we may or may not have, but e eToro has been profitable for the fourth year in a row. Uh, we we announced that uh, last year we've rec we've booked more than six hundred million dollars in revenue, um, and so we are uh, we're definitely a high growth company. We're expanding globally, and uh, in terms of our uh, IPO plans, can't comment at uh, at this moment. All right. Thank you very much, Guy, for joining us this morning from Tel Aviv. Thank you. All right. That was Guy Hirsch, Managing Director for eToro's U.S. region. Coming up, ETH all-time high analysis with T PwC's global crypto leader, Henry Arzlanian.
Welcome back. The Elon effect is giving alternative cryptocurrencies a boost. Ether breaching 1800 to new lifetime highs amid continuing drying up of sell side liquidity in the market earlier. But right now, uh, price is settling down. Well, 1741 right now, according to trade block data. Uh, joining us to discuss further is PwC global crypto leader, Henry Arslanian. Welcome, Henry. Thanks for having me and congratulations on the launch. Thank you. We're all <laughs> still with that afterglow. All right. So what is your analysis of what is driving ETH to record highs? One of your predictions for 2021 was that DeFi would continue to see explosive growth. Is that a factor? Oh, absolutely. I think when you look at, at there's many I think, different drivers that are really driving the price there. I think there's, let me, the first one is obviously for many users, let's say let's take like retail investors as well as institutional, often after Bitcoin where they, it's their entry point, ETH is often the natural choice. And one of the reasons you're seeing the CME launch their, their, their uh, futures is actually one of the reasons behind that as well. Second is really, I think when it comes to ETH, I think we should not forget that it still has a very big developer community on Solidity and others. And of course, if we look at the vast majority of stable coins and DeFi, as you mentioned, a lot of it is also driven on at. And third, I think we should not forget that some of the traditional criticism towards Ethereum, whether it's scalability and others, are now being addressed with at 2.0. And we will see the transition towards that over the next two years from the beacon chain to the other, other transition. So I think there's a lot of positive momentum with ETH. So I think it's definitely an area to watch over the next couple of months. So on a different topic, uh, G7 financial leaders are going to meet on Friday and uh, digital currencies, government backed digital currencies are, are expected to come up. I, I know you've also written a little bit about China and the role of China's digital currency. So could you just explain simply like what the impact on the rest of the world is likely to be? Um, I feel like a lot of people are not fully tuned into how big a transformation this will this will have. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. I think there's a lot of uh, what amazes me being based normally in Hong Kong is when I see a lot of conversations globally around central bank digital currencies, often how China is not discussed as much as it should. I mean, just to put things mm -hmm. in perspective, China has been researching the topic of CBDCs since 2014. And obviously, yeah. uh, I would argue that China is easily four to five years ahead when it comes to the topic of CBDC, especially retail CBDC uh, globally. I think some of the things to watch will be, uh, as right now, they're going through their phases of pilots. Just to put things in perspective, in recent months, over 2 billion renminbi, that's 300 million US dollars, were transacted in CBDC. Even until last weekend or two weekends ago, a lottery, another lottery happened in Shenzhen, uh, you know, where uh, thousands of residents got around 200 renminbi, that's about $30 in digital central bank money that they were able to use in about 10,000 merchants across the city. So really a lot of activity there. So I think what's going to happen in China is going to set the pace and kind of be the testing ground when it comes not only the future, but the central bank digital currencies, but probably also the future of money. Do you think I mean, people are definitely effort? sleeping on it in the, in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is not tuned into it. Uh, so, so how can it affect the U.S. or the U.S. dollar specifically? I think that's the way to get attention here to, is to describe like what the specific impact might be. Yeah, I would argue it's a very good question. I would argue actually that the, the currently the retail CBDs initiatives in China with their ECNY or DCEP or digital yuan, whatever you want to call it, really their goal is not to dislodge the US dollar. I mean, I would even argue the whole broader cryptocurrency uh, movement. Look at stable coins, for example, today, over 95% of stable coins are actually pegged to US dollar. So in a way, it kind of makes the horse faster from that perspective. However, when it comes to the policy making perspective, I think what's happening in, in, in China is going to kind of catalyze some of the efforts around the world, including the U.S. And I think what's going to be very interesting to watch over the next couple of weeks and months is really what's going to happen with Janet Yellen and the broader in the new under new leadership in the U.S. Uh, whether we'll see increased activity when it comes to what the Fed may be doing on uh, digital currencies. To be fair, the U.S. over the last couple of months, we've seen tremendous activity on the crypto side. The OCC has been a great example uh, with the recent guidance at the beginning of last month with stable coins, uh, the usage by banks. So I'm really keeping an eye on what's going to happen uh, on, let's say, the central bank uh, push when it comes to the U.S. over the next couple of months. Do you think we'll see some coordinated efforts on part of the, of the G7 countries to get a, a set standard or... Uh, some sort of action with when it comes to uh, CBDCs. 
Great question, Lawrence. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, coordinate is a, is, a, is a difficult word. I mean, I think what we've seen over the last couple of months, there's definitely been more collaboration. Uh, we're already seeing this at the Bank for International Settlements, which is kind of the club of central banks uh, and really the, a lot of the, the activity going on there. Um, I think what's going to be interesting is also that a lot of countries who have technology within the G7 and G20 as well have different priorities. For example, when you're looking at a lot of the emerging uh, markets, a lot of emerging countries, retail CBDC is a big focus. However, when you're looking at a lot of developed countries, uh, look at countries like you know Sweden, the UK, uh, Hong Kong, and others, obviously there's a big focus on wholesale CBDC. And obviously both have different use cases, but both are very, very positive. Uh, but I think we have to acknowledge that each country has different steps. That being said, Lawrence, I think globally, when we look at some of the issues that we are facing, whether it's you know, quantitative easing, whether it's the less usage of cash as a form of payment, whether it's increased cash hoarding, which is something that happens in every country in a time of crisis. There's a lot of common denominator, if you want. Uh, but again, I think how every country is going to address it will vary depending on their specific circumstances, as we've seen over the last couple of months. Great. Thank you so much, Henry, for joining us from Dubai, no less. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good. Congratulations again. All right, that was Henry Arzlanian, PwC Global Crypto Leader. Coming up, the Bitcoin mining energy debate continues and checking in with Coindesk regulatory reporter Nick Day. A decade ago, the world changed. A decade ago, the economy changed. A decade ago, money changed. Well, the greatest change in money in generations saw successes and failures, scams, thefts, it also contributed to the advancement of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the power to finance crazy ideas, and our ability to imagine a stronger future for our digital world. And Coindesk was there for it all. Created in the early days of Bitcoin, Coindesk was here to be the trusted news source for the new technological boom. As the industry evolved, Coindesk was there. As markets reached new highs and lows, Coindesk was there. When major news broke, Coindesk was there. We were there with events, news, data, insight. We brought you exclusive interviews and unprecedented access. Today, blockchain technology is the most interesting story in global finance. Powered by some of the most talented analysts, entrepreneurs, developers, cryptographers, and investors in the world. Now a power battle is brewing in the next decade. With the future of the global financial system at stake, Coindesk is here to be your essential information source. To define the issues, answer the big questions, and to connect the entire industry with the most expansive and in-depth media platform in the world. Coindesk, we're here for the revolution. Welcome back. Time to check in with Coindesk regulatory reporter Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk's The State of Crypto newsletter. Hey there, Nick. Hey, how's it going? Good. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening globally. So in your newsletter, you talk about crypto crackdowns that are happening in all over the world from India to Nigeria. And while these not might not be necessarily new, like versions of this have happened before, why do you think why why this resurgence? Why why is this happening again now? Yeah, it could just be that this is the time everyone's paying attention to crypto, the massive price run up over the last couple of months. And, you know, just even looking at Twitter, where you have celebrities tweeting about buying into various cryptocurrencies or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yesterday, Tesla putting uh, well, you know, one and a half billion dollars into Bitcoin. It seems like this is now the time everyone's really paying attention. And that might be what's causing the you know, governments of India and the Central Bank of Nigeria to, you know, say to remind, so to speak, you know, their banks that they shouldn't be providing access to uh, crypto exchanges or, you know, trying to create new laws that would restrict such access. Yeah, in a funny way, it's almost a bullish sign, right? Like if crypto wasn't a real phenomenon, these governments wouldn't care that much about it, right? They're cracking down because it's actually finally having an impact. Um, like in the case of, of India specifically, what are authorities so afraid of? Like, what are they worried about? That's a good question. They've said, you know, um, they have concerns about illicit financing, um, things like that. It really uh, kind of reminds me of just, you know, there's this, there's been this kind of trend over the last couple of years of, you know, at least India's government trying to maintain control over its, you know, money supply and how thing, you know, how cash is handled in, you know, within its borders. So part of me wonders if that's not just, you know, if this new crypto ban isn't just an extension of that.
India mm -hmm. has a and what, uh, market with, uh, is, is there going to be any political pressure from them uh, to say, hey, can you guys back off a little bit while we grow? Exchanges are definitely trying to prevent this from happening. They started a campaign. Um, you know, our markets reporter, Omkar, has covered that. I have no idea how successful that will be. It, you know, it's really going to depend on, uh, you know, who in the government is spearheading this and whether or not they're interested in, you know, hearing from crypto, you know, crypto industry, right? You know, just looking at, you know, a U.S. analogy, you have Steven Nuchin, who was, you know, said to be spearheading that FinCEN rule. And it wasn't until he left office that that whole process was slowed down. So it's going to depend on who's spearheading this. Nick, today in D.C., well, the Trump and uh, just on another subject, the Trump impeachment trial gets underway. I wonder, I imagine crypto is not on everyone's top of mind, but what is the state of crypto in D.C. right now? So there are a couple hearings coming up that are probably relevant that need to be paid attention to. The first one is next week. That's, um, you know, the House Financial Services Committee is holding a hearing on Robinhood and GameStop. That's kind of more adjacent to the crypto industry. But if we're looking at it as a, you know, how are, you know, how is Congress looking at retail platforms versus, uh, you know, these brokerages versus the people trading? That's probably a relevant one to be paying attention to. Later this month on the 23rd, there's going to be a hearing on, uh, you know, uh, financing for domestic terrorism in the wake of the January 6th insurrection. I imagine that one's going to be a lot more uh, relevant to the crypto folks. Uh, you know, you might recall that there was that $500,000 Bitcoin transaction in December that may or may not have gone to figures who were later present at the Capitol, six, uh, Capitol uh, insurrection on January 6th. All right. Thank you very, Nick, for your daily check-in. Thank you. Thanks. That was Coindesk regulatory reporter Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. Meanwhile, Bitcoin's energy footprint has been a standing controversy. Critics argue the amount of energy required to confirm transactions across the Bitcoin network is bad for the environment. It requires so-called mining farms, that is, large data centers that the Iranian government recently blamed for causing power outages across the country. To be sure, the government also said miners only consume 2% of Iran's electricity, according to the Associated Press. So our next guest recently wrote an opinion article on the subject published on Coindesk. Joining me now is Nick Carter, a founding partner at Castle Island Ventures. Welcome, Nick. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you here. So your firm recently closed a $50 million investment fund. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bloomberg published an article calling Bitcoin an incredibly dirty business, comparing the Bitcoin network to the Visa payments network, which you say <coughs> is misleading. So break it down for us. Yeah, I would say it's it's a, a erroneous comparison. Bitcoin is a full stack monetary network and Bitcoin carries out a number of different functions. It's not solely a payments network. Bitcoin proposes its own unit of account. So in a sense, if you had to compare Bitcoin with another network, you would want to compare with the entire dollar infrastructure and all the political forces that keep the dollar afloat. So if you want to compare like with like, you have to reach far beyond re Visa and compare it to really the dollar system as a whole, which is very wasteful or not necessarily wasteful, but consumes a lot of energy, as we know. I mean, what is the key entity that backstops the U.S. dollar? That's the U.S. government and all of its diplomatic and military uh, capacity. So Visa is just a thin layer in that dollar stack. It's a thin payment system, whereas Bitcoin is the entire self-contained monetary network. So it's not a fair comparison, in my view. Nick, I'm glad that glad you're here. Um, one uh, question I have, of course, has to do with Diginomics itself, which seems to be the source of so much of this uh, doom and gloom about the use of energy in mining Bitcoin. Uh, it, it, a lot of the assumptions made there uh, on, on that site uh, are very blanket and use old data and things like that. I think they once predicted that like half the energy in the in the entire world would be used for Bitcoin mining by 2020. Of course, that didn't happen. Why is there such a pull for journalists and the like uh, to use Diginomics data, even though a lot of its assumptions are kind of very, uh, shall we say, broad and, 
and not detailed? Yeah, it's a great question, honestly. And, and high quality data is such a problem in this industry. Uh, Digiconomist, the individual that curates that site, is clearly an ardent opponent of Bitcoin, which makes me wonder whether that data is really particularly credible. I would defer to the Cambridge uh, estimates of Bitcoin's footprint. But the truth is, it provides fertile ammunition for critics because Bitcoin is very transparent, whereas other industries are not as easy to quantify in terms of their energy footprint. And so that's why Bitcoin gets singled out for particular critique, because it's really not that difficult to run the calculation, and figure out how much energy overhead uh, consumes. Look at other industries like aluminum or you know, metal smelting or even things like leaving the lights on and leaving appliances plugged in. Okay. That's harder to quantify, you know. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, Bitcoin is very transparent. So there's always plenty of ammunition for the critics. So, uh, Nick, just taking this in, a, in another direction, where do you think Elon Musk got all that Bitcoin from? I like, where do you buy it honestly from? don't know. I, if I had to guess, I would say <laughs> yeah, he probably yeah, yeah. is one of those, uh, one of those entities, um, Coinbase Prime or uh, Nidig. Uh, I'm sure it'll be released. Uh, could have been my, my former colleagues at Fidelity Digital Assets. Um, I'm sure we'll find out in the coming weeks who are used. But the, regardless, there's large entities which are now able to be the counterparties to that trade, which is the good news that means that firms like Tesla uh, can get onboarded without too much without too much difficulty. So he probably wasn't using Robinhood or or uh, or, or PayPal. But um, at, at the, one question I have about with uh, selling, are, are we seeing what are we seeing with the miners? Are are they selling? Are they, are they holding? What what do we know about what the miners are doing right now? It's honestly very difficult to triangulate minor activity. And this is actually another question of data quality is a lot of people run that analysis where they look at the first hop from the Coinbase output and they presume that that identifies the miners, but that's not necessarily the case. You really do have to look uh, at multiple hops and try and disambiguate the pools uh, from the individual miners. Um, so some of those data sources that people rely on to ascertain minor behavior are not really that reliable. Um, so the truth is we don't exactly know what miners are doing. And people that claim that they do know are often just looking at noise in the blockchain. Nick, just Let's talk about Doge Mania for a second. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, um, Emily. I know you want the Doge no, to get in there. Just I really want to ask the Doge question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just talk about Doge Mania for a second because there's two theories on this about how it affects the industry. You know, there's people who say, like, it's good. It's like a gateway to crypto. It gets people learning about it. And then there's others that say that it's actually not good for the industry, right? This is not the, the, the crypto that should be representing the industry. And I saw your tweets about it, which kind of had both, right? You said you experimented with it early, but now it's kind of like, a, I think you said it was an empty husk. Or, I'm just curious, so what, what do you think about this Doge mania? And is it, is it good for the crypto industry as a whole? So I wish that people's first impressions of Doge was them using it in the way that it was intended to be used, which is as a fast transaction. It, we can debate the meaning of fast settling and so on, but as a playful way to engage with crypto in a low stress way in a low stakes way that was how i first got my start with doge i got tips some doge on reddit back in 2013 that was my first brush with crypto and then i mined some doge that was my introduction to this industry and then you know from there i found bitcoin and i got more serious about it however people's now their first impression the way they're interacting with doge is they're just getting financial exposure to it and I mean, it's, it looks like a gigantic pump and dump, if we're going to be honest here. Obviously, the Doge uh, rally is not going to endure here because there's nothing concrete behind it. And Doge itself is built on this ancient fork of Bitcoin, which is really not safe to use. The Doge network is probably not particularly safe. It's merged mined with Litecoin. There's a whole bunch of issues there. And of course, it doesn't really have any active developers on the code base. So it's it's not really a safe blockchain to be used. It's largely unmaintained. Uh, so that's why I refer to it as a husk. Regardless, I wish that the people that are buying Doge were actually experimenting with it and learning about what it's like to make a transaction on-chain 
for the most part, my guess is they're just gaining financial exposure to it through exchanges, and they're not actually ex- experiencing the joy of transacting on the blockchain, which is the magical thing. And that was what got me so entranced by it back in the day. So certainly Doge had this playful attitude in 2013-14. It was really fun. And the Dogecoin community had this great spirit and did all these great charitable initiatives, sort of really tongue-in-cheek playful initiatives like sending the Jamaican bobsled team to the Olympics, if you remember that. So it was all, it was all pretty entertaining. Today, it's a little more cynical, if we're going to be honest. And uh, I, I think it's a shame that newcomers to the industry, their first brush with crypto is going to be buying Doge at an inflated valuation and subsequently losing money. Nick, just one final question quickly. You, I, Castle Island Ventures just raised $50 million. Where do you plan to allocate the funds? Maybe Doge. Uh, no Doge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not planning. That was planning. a takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> Same, same strategy, same thesis. We're very encouraged by the success of the portfolio companies in Castle Island One. Um, more to share on that soon. We continue to invest in crypto financial infrastructure. So we believe this is a decades-long monetary transition. We are trying to support the entrepreneurs that are building the startups, making it easier to engage with crypto assets and facilitating that transition from the fiat world to the crypto world. That's our view. That's pretty much unchanged. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time to come on our show and sharing your insights. Thanks so much for having me. All right. That was Nick Carter, a founding partner at Castle Island Ventures. Time now to check in with crypto Twitter for our tweet of the day. This one coming in from user Christy Hightower saying, Boyfriend just admitted he sold his hashtag Bitcoin at $30,000 months ago, rethinking everything. Yeah, it's it's tough. All right, that's it for First Mover tomorrow. Economist and vocal Bitcoin critic Nouriel Rubini joins us probably to poo-poo on everyone's Bitcoin parade. Contrarian views. You won't want to miss it. Thank you, Emily Parker, our Coindesk Global Macro Editor, and Lawrence Lewitton, Markets Managing Editor. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with All About Bitcoin. Coming up at noon is The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.